Very glad that all of you are here. Thank you for coming and being with us. This is your first time here. This is about how it goes most of the time. We're glad that you're here to be with us, and we hope that you will come and join us again in the future. If you have not gone by the table yet, go by and get the gift that we have for you up here, and uh, there's more information on our table. We hope that you'll do that and meet the people that will be there at the end of the service. But we're glad that you've come to be with us. We hope that you will come back and be with us again. Join me this morning in our litany of praise and worship, praise and gratitude. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say, His steadfast love endures forever. Let the troubled and worried say, His steadfast love endures forever. Let the lost and wandering say, Let the blessed and grateful say, His steadfast love endures forever. Let us praise God in the church. Let us praise Him in our homes. Let us praise Him in the workplace. Let us praise Him day and night. Let us praise and worship the Lord our God. And let us give thanks for His blessings. For our God is good and worthy of praise. His steadfast love endures forever. Holy God, I thank you for your steadfast love. I thank you that no matter what comes our way and no matter what is happening within our world, your steadfast love endures forever. Help us to celebrate that today, O Lord. Help us to give thanks for that, not just today and not just in this season, but in every day of our lives. Let us remember that you are a God of love who is always standing beside us. You are always on our side. Today, O Lord, let that spirit of love and grace and hope and peace fall upon us as we gather here and help us to know as we come here to worship you that you are not only worthy of our praise, but you are looking forward to being with us. Help us to look forward to being with you and to experiencing you as we gather. For it is in your name we offer our prayer. Amen. So let's pray together, shall we? Oh God, our imaginations are just too small to understand how wonderfully connected everything is and how we are a part of the divine fabric that comprises all of creation and binds us to every living thing in this universe that you've made. So we pray that even this morning that we would be mindful that indeed all blessings flow from you. You are the author you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. So help us to be truly grateful for all that you freely give to us, for this incomparably beautiful world that we live in, filled with trees and flowers and mountains and rivers and oceans, for our bodies that are so intricately and incredibly made, for our networks of family and friends who who sustain us with love and joy and companionship for your church where we can come and worship and fellowship freely and contemplate all the ways that you are a part of our lives, for the wonders of technology and medicine and transportation that sustain and enrich us every day, and for the gospel, for the good news of Jesus Christ that reminds us of your grace and mercy and forgiveness and love and compassion for us. We're grateful that you, you love us, you provide for us in spite of our vast limitations and that you are working in us that we might experience the full peace and harmony of your vast kingdom. Oh God, as we begin to enter into this month of thanksgiving, Help us amid all that is going on and the busyness of our lives to be, to be careful, to set aside time to recognize and to honor you for providing all that we need and for many of our wants. Give us hearts that are full of gratitude and that we would be mindful that there are people all over this world who do not have as much as we do for which to be thankful so make us mindful that we live in a world that's full of people who lack adequate food, housing, or medical care. There are those who have terrible diseases. There are those who live in war-torn countries where they fear daily for their lives. There are those who have fractured relationships and are not at peace with, with others or even with themselves. 
So be with them, Lord, and help them as only you can, even in the midst of their circumstances, to have hope in you. Give them your peace and help us out of our, our bounty to learn to share what we have with them as we have opportunity and to make this world more like your kingdom of love and light. Oh God, as our nation gathers this very week to engage in the great act of electing those who would lead our nation, we give thanks for the privilege and the opportunity that's been given us to live in a democracy and for the freedom we have to choose those who would guide us. So help us not to take this gift for granted, but to faithfully exercise our civic responsibility with wisdom and with discernment. And whatever the outcome, we pray for a spirit of peace and unity and a desire to work together to bring about the more perfect union that our forefathers envisioned for us to be. Oh God, we thank you for the hope that you give us, for the promise of a prosperous future, and even while we seek your kingdom here on earth, even as it is in heaven, help us to look forward with anticipation to that final gathering of your saints into a heavenly rest where all life centers on you and your son Jesus, and we shall be caught up in eternal gratitude. But in the meantime, Lord, strengthen us and sustain us to do your kingdom work in the here and now. This is our prayer. We pray it in the name of the King of kings and the Lord of lords who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, would be thy name. Kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Greg Anderson is the pastor of Union Church in Hong Kong. <clears throat> that church is one of the most famous churches in the world. If you're in our business, it had a very rich history for many, many years there, and particularly had a rich history during World War II. Greg is a storyteller. One of his favorite stories to tell is about a man named Cal who, whose wife just suddenly left him. They had been married for 22 years. He thought they had an idyllic marriage until she just left one day. He had no idea she was unhappy until she left. Cal was absolutely devastated when his wife walked out. He, he tried to talk to her. She would not talk to him at all. He tried to call her. She sent him messages that you can talk to me through my attorney and no one else. She had completely rejected him. And, and, in the, and after that, Cal began to lose faith in about everything, and that included his faith in God. One morning, several weeks after Cal had left, uh, Cal went to a restaurant for breakfast. He got there. The place was full of people, but nobody was talking to each other. They were just eating their breakfast. Cal ordered his food, and then he just sat and he stared into his coffee cup, depressed. In the booth right beside them, there was a mother and her five-year-old daughter. They had just brought them their food. The little girl looked at her mother and said, Mama, can we say the blessing here? The server was still standing there. The server said, Sure, sweetheart, you can say the blessing. And so the little girl stood up in her seat at the booth, and she yelled across the room and said, Everybody bow your heads. <laughs> so they said the room all looked and smiled, and they all bowed their heads when they did. <clears throat> this little girl stood there and she said, God is great, God is good, and I thank him for our food. Amen. When it did, the entire room started applauding. They all kind of thanked the little girl for the prayer. And, and then they all started talking to each other about what had just happened. And when they did, the server said, sweetheart, you need to come here and do that every day. That prayer changed everything. It did change about everything that day, and one of the things that it changed the most was Cal. Cal said, I don't know what happened to me that day. I don't know why that prayer had so much effect on me, but that one prayer 
changed everything for me. He said, that little girl's prayer showed me that I needed to thank God for what I had instead of just thinking about what I didn't have. He said, thanking God didn't make the hurt go away that day, but it did remind me that I had more than I had lost and I needed to thank God for it. Cal said, that prayer made me realize that I needed to live up to the struggle that I was in in my life, rather than living down in the struggle, and I needed to be grateful for my life and for all that God had given me instead of just being resentful for what I had lost. There are at least two quick lessons that we need to learn from this. The first one is... We're going to have an election this Tuesday, and some of us are going to be happy with that election, and some of us are not. So we need to decide right now if we're going to live up to the issues that, that this election is going to bring out, or are we going to live in our resentment that, that, that it didn't go the way we wanted it to and that we're mad about it. Here's a fact that all of us need to claim, and we need to claim it right now. Whatever happens on Tuesday, God is still on his throne. He is still on our side, and he is still wanting us to represent him in our world because our first and most important loyalty in this world is to Jesus Christ. That flag is the one that we owe our ultimate allegiance to, not this one. And so don't forget that in the next few days. Let's make the commitment to talk and act like God's people, whether things turn out the way we want them to or not. The second thing we need to remember is that we are entering the season of thanksgiving. So instead of focusing on what annoys us, we need to focus on what we are thankful for. But I know that's hard. I know it's a hard thing for us to do because I'm 67 years old and I have never seen our country more divided and more angered, angered and more distrusting than it is right now. So focusing on what you're thankful for may not be as easy as we think it is going to be. However, let's remember something here. God didn't call his people to do the easy stuff. He called us to do the hard stuff, stuff like loving our neighbor as ourselves, stuff like loving one another as God has loved us. The hard stuff is a gift from God as well, and we need to be thankful for it. We need to live into it. We need to do all that we can to be the best example we can of the love that comes to us, the grace that comes to us, the strength that comes to us, both in the easy times and the hard times. This past Tuesday, a friend of mine was talking to me about the division that we're seeing in our country, and he said, I'm just ready for 2024 to be over. He said, I'm tired of the politics, I'm tired of the stupid commercials, and I'm tired of the mess that goes on with it. If you're grateful for the commercials, raise your hand. I'm grateful for the mute button. Thank the Lord for the mute button. I did that this morning. I, that's, you know, I would tell you which commercial was on, but I won't do that. Because it doesn't matter which one it is. I'm sick of it. I don't want to hear any more of them. Now may the Lord bless and keep you. And it's, you know, I'm ready for it to be over just like everybody else is ready for it to be over. But I've got news for you. The division in this country is not going to be over on Tuesday. It's going to take a lot to bring people back together. It's going to take a lot to fix what's been going wrong. It's going to take people who are intentional about wanting to fix what's going on. It's going to take a lot to try to bring this country back to where it was just a few years ago. So we need to make sure that we as the people of Jesus Christ are setting the example for healing instead of being part of the division that we see in our country. And we need to make that commitment today, not somewhere out in front of us. I'm ready for the division to be over just like everybody else is, but my job is to remind everybody that we need to take this time seriously and we need to take the time to think about what we're thankful for in 2024 it may not be easy 
God never said serving him would be. Yes, our country is in the midst of struggle, but everything hasn't been a struggle in life. So what do we have to be thankful for? Or to say it differently, we need to give thanks for our blessings. Why? Because giving thanks can change things, and we need to be part of that change. In fact, we need to try to lead in that change. Our scripture today is a story of change in the midst of struggle, and it's a story about giving thanks and how it can reorient a person's life. Luke 17, 11 through 19. As Jesus was going to Jerusalem, he came to the border between Galilee and Samaria. As he entered the village there, ten lepers stood at a distance, and they cried out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Jesus looked at them, and he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were all cleansed of their leprosy. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus, giving praise to God. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, and he thanked him for what he had done. And this man was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Didn't I heal ten men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? Then Jesus said to the man, Stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. Friends, don't ever think that death is the worst thing that can happen to you in life because I promise you, it is not. I used to visit a man with Alzheimer's disease. When I first started visiting with him, we could still say, talk about a lot of things. He could still remember a lot of things. He, he talked about his wife. He talked about his children. He talked about his grandchildren. Ten years later, when he finally passed away, he was lying in a bed wearing an adult diaper, and he didn't know anything or anybody. He never had any idea that I was in his room. He had no idea when his family would come to see him. He just lay there in that bed day after day, chattering words that didn't make any sense at all, and he did that for five years. There are things that are worse than death in life. And those 10 lepers understood that just about as well as anybody could. Those men were still breathing and they still had hopes and dreams and fears and worries. But for all practical purposes, they were the walking dead of Israel. Leprosy was the worst disease of the ancient world. It dissolved flesh and bone. And if you had leprosy, you were an outcast from society. They had no idea what caused diseases to spread, but they knew that they did, and so they wanted to make sure that people stayed away. If you had leprosy, you had to stay the equivalent of what would be today 50 yards against people, a half a football field away from everybody else. And if a leper saw another person coming toward them, they had to start yelling, unclean, I am a leper, unclean. And when they did, most people would throw rocks at them to try to get them to stay further away from them. Then on top of all of that, most people believed that if a person had leprosy, it was God's will. God was cursing them for something. So those lepers not only felt rejected by society, they not only felt rejected by the people who were around them, but they thought they had been rejected by God. How could you feel worse than that? Leprosy was a terrible disease, but even in this terrible situation, those men still had some things to be thankful for because they had each other. They had formed community with each other. Lepers would almost always form a community of suffering, and that suffering broke down the barriers that had kept people apart. And if you don't believe that, just remember there was a Samaritan in this community of suffering. The Jews hated the Samaritans because the, the Samaritans had intermingled in their marriages and, had, had, and, and they had somewhat destroyed the pure bloodline of the Jewish people. And so the Jews referred to them as infidel dogs. That was one of the nicer things they said about them. But now these Jews and this Samaritan had contracted the worst disease in the world. And all of a sudden they forgot what was supposed to be separating them. And they just came together in a community of suffering to support each other. 
Nathan Dolls is a member of our church. He spent the last four weekends in North Carolina trying to help flood victims in the most rural parts of that state. The authorities down there had put out a call for anybody who had four-wheelers to try to come and help. Nathan put together a group, and they went down there to help. They've been going down there to help over and over. Nobody in those devastated areas down there, they're not talking about politics. No matter what the media says, they're not talking about politics. They're not talking about President Trump or Vice President Harris. They're, those people are just trying to survive. And the way they're doing that is they're coming together. They're sharing what little they have with the people who are around them. They formed communities of suffering anywhere they can. And they're working together to try to help each other. They're giving thanks for what little they have left. And they're trying to love and help each other as best they can. The first point that we need to take away from this biblical story this morning is even when we're struggling there's always something to give thankful for and we owe it to God and to ourselves to look for whatever it is and to give thanks for it as best we can because giving thanks not only pleases God but it pulls us up it sets an example of straightening up in the midst of the struggles and it gives life meaning as we are going along. I may have told this before, but Martin Rinkert was a Lutheran minister who lived in Eilenburg, Germany in the 1600s. Germany was fighting the Thirty Years' War. Germany seems to always be fighting about something. But anyway, they were fighting the Thirty Years' War, and, and Eilenburg had been kind of a haven of safety during that war because it was a fortified city. It had a wall around it, and, and that was great until the refugees from the war started showing up in Eilenburg. Over 10,000 people came to that city within just a few weeks when they did. They started running low on food, and then raw sewage started running in the streets, and then a famine broke out in that region, and people started starving to death. And then the plague hit that city, and people started dying by the hundreds every day. Over 6,000 people died in one year, and Martin Rinkert led over 4,500 of those funerals, six of which were his wife and his five children. On a cold night in 1637, Martin said that he was sitting in his house crying because he had just buried his last child that day. Martin was ready to give up. He was sitting there thinking about suicide. But then for some reason, Martin started writing down all of the things in his life that he was thankful for. By the time he had finished, he had stopped writing a thank you list, and he had started writing what became one of the greatest hymns in Christian history. Can you imagine writing that if you had lost one of your family members? Can you imagine writing that if, if there was plague and pestilence all around you? Can you imagine writing that when you have lost the people that you love the most when that included everybody that you lived with? Martin Rinkert was ready to give up on life until he started giving thanks for his blessings. And, and not only did, did he have a thank you list that he created, but, but what he wrote gave him the boost that he needed to keep going. And the hymn that he wrote that night has been inspiring people who are struggling for four hundred years. I would like to think that I would do something in the course of my ministry that would inspire somebody for 400 minutes. 
much less for 400 years. But Martin Rinkert accomplished that when he was grieving as we could not imagine. Even in the midst of suffering and struggle and anger and worry and division, there is always something to be thankful for. But if we stop there, we're stopping a step too soon because the second lesson of this Bible story is we need to express our thanks for the blessings of life. We need to express our thanks to God and we need to express our thanks to those that we love in this world. One day Jesus was going through the village on the border of Galilee and Samaria. He saw 10 lepers that were right down the road. By the law, those lepers were supposed to yell unclean, but apparently these men had heard that Jesus had healed people with leprosy. And so when Jesus got close enough, they started yelling all right, but what they yelled was, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when they did, Jesus said, go show yourselves to the priests. That would have been a great thing to do. They would have had no hesitation to do that at all except for one thing. These guys were asking for mercy, and Jesus had just given these men a death sentence. It was against the law for a leper to be within the shadow of the temple at any time of the day. The temple sat high on Temple Mount, and the temple itself was over 150 feet tall. In the afternoon, the temple shadow would stretch out over 500 yards. If a leper was found within that shadow, they were stoned to death on the spot. They knew what was going to happen to them when they got to Jerusalem. Those lepers knew if they did what Jesus told them to do, they were going to die. And remember, they weren't healed at that time. They weren't healed when Jesus told them to go show themselves to the priest. They were still suffering with, with leprosy when they started that journey to Jerusalem. They were sick. They were maimed. Everybody was going to see what was going on with them. But what's interesting is those men went to the temple anyway. Because they trusted Jesus. And what did they have to lose? I mean, they were going to die anyway, but if Jesus was really who he said he was, this journey just might pay off. And so those men started to the temple that day, and sure enough, somewhere along the way, all ten of those men were healed. Can you imagine the celebration that broke out on that, that road? Can you imagine the, the feelings that they had? Those people were going to get to go back to their families. They were going to have productive lives again. All ten of those men were thankful for what they experienced that day, but the divisions in society immediately broke back out because Nine of those men were going to get to go into Jerusalem. The Samaritan had to turn around and go back to Samaria, which was the opposite direction. The division started, but Thanksgiving was still there. These men were going to get to go back to their lives. All ten of them were thankful. But only one man went to tell Jesus that he was thankful, that hated foreigner. The reason that he went to do what he did that day was because he knew. He seemed to be the only one who knew. If he went to thank Jesus, he was thanking God. In just a minute, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And when we take this meal, we need to remember that when Jesus gave us this meal, he was setting an example for all of us. The first communion came on a night of struggle. It came on a night of worry. It came on a night when division broke out between Jesus and his own disciples. He needed those men to be with him. But Jesus was going to betray him before the night was out. Everybody else was going to abandon him. But instead of becoming bitter and resentful and hateful and giving up, Jesus took bread and he blessed it. And he gave it to the disciples and he said, this is my body which is given for you. Whenever you eat this, do this in remembrance of me. And then after they had eaten the bread, the Bible says, Jesus took a cup and he gave thanks. And then he gave it to them. And he said, this is my blood which is given to you for the forgiveness of sins. 
on the worst night of his life when his friends were causing division. Jesus called his people together and he gave thanks to God for them. He gave thanks to God for God's blessings. He gave thanks to God for the future that was about to come. He gave thanks to God that they were all going to respond to his call and they were going to go into the world to try to make the world a better place. Jesus gave thanks, but he expressed it to the ones who were about to abandon him. He expressed it to the ones who were about to leave him alone. He expressed it to the one who was about to betray him. Never forget, when Judas came to betray him, the first thing Jesus said was, Friend, why are you here? Jesus never quit seeing Judas as a friend, even when Judas's very acts were saying, I'm not. Jesus gave thanks that night, and he calls upon us to be a thankful people. When he gave them this meal, he gave it to them to remind them that God's love is the greatest gift that we can ever have, and that gift can change us, and it can change those around us if we'll let it live through us. Today, when we eat this meal, Let's take time to give thanks to God for our blessings. Let's take time to tell someone around us how much they've meant to us or, or why we love them or, or why we're glad to get to see them on Sundays. And, and let's make the commitment within our hearts to become a source of healing in our world. Let's remember that there's not a problem in this world that's bigger than the God who loves us forever. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you. I thank you so much. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your forgiveness. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you that you are the one who gives us hope even when life seems hopeless. I thank you that you're the one who stands beside us to strengthen us even when we are feeling too weak to go on. I thank you that you are the one who can inspire us to do great and lasting things even when it feels like we don't have the strength to put one foot in front of the other. I thank you, O oh Lord, for what this meal means to us. I thank you that when we eat this meal, we are being reminded that on the worst night that humankind ever had, you never gave up on humankind. You believed in them and you had faith that they were going to make a difference in the world. You gave thanks for those people. When they were about to mess up, you, you had all of the faith in the world that they were still going to go and carry your message. Remind us, O oh Lord, that you have faith in us too. You have faith in your people. You have faith in your church. You have faith in the future. You have faith that in whatever situation comes before us, by our commitments, we can make a difference. Help us to be thankful to you today, O oh Lord. Help us to be thankful for the, for the sacrifice that you made 2,000 years ago, that you did not lash out and try to destroy the world when it was trying to destroy you, but you looked down from a cross of suffering and you said, Father, forgive them they don't know what they're doing those words still ring today and they ring for us help us O oh lord that death did not conquer you and they did not conquer your son but there is nothing that's going to conquer what you create and what you love come to us today lord jesus let your spirit fall upon our lives and let this moment when we when we share this meal be a moment of thanksgiving and a moment of commitment. For it is in your name we offer our prayer. Amen. On the night that he was handed over for suffering and death, Jesus took bread and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Whenever you eat this, do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together.
after they had eaten, Jesus took a cup and he blessed it. He gave thanks. And then he said, this is the blood of the new covenant that is given to you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. Oh, Lord, I do give thanks for this meal. I give thanks for what you bring to us. I give thanks for what you call us to. I give thanks for the hope that we have as we walk with you. I give thanks for the blessings that you have been for us and the blessings that we can be to those around us. Remind us, O oh Lord, of your presence and of your strength. Remind us that we are the people who are forgiven, who are empowered, and who are loved forever. May it all change our lives. And may we be reminded every day that we live that it can be well with our souls no matter what. In your name we pray. Amen. If you have come to the place today where you want to give your life to Jesus Christ and you want to follow him in baptism and in every day that you live, please come and let any member of our staff or any of our deacons know that and we'll help you with the next steps of baptism and, and, and trying to help you grow in your faith. If you want to join our church and be part of the missions that we are on, then we'd love to have you. Let us know that and we'll try to help you with the next steps of that as well. Let's go into this week confident that we are God's people that we have jobs to do and that we can do them even when we may not be as happy as we want to be. And let's know that our God loves us and believes in us and we have a job to do. Now may the Lord bless and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and give you peace this day and every day, now and forevermore. Amen.